We've been about this work, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, shared through the voices of a white woman and a black man. We bring lived experiences. We have pursued DNI progress for most of our professional lives. We use Crazy and the King to cover news, tips from colleagues, and host incredible guests. Listeners, count on Julie and I to transparently drive the conversation. We thank you for rocking with us. Check it. Julie, kick off the show. To crazy and the king rock rock let me tell you something let me uh, this whole being on camera thing is like always interesting for me now here's the deal this week jay you see what i got on right i do question is was i wearing this last week when we recorded no i think it was a different sweatshirt last week was it I see I here's the issue on it yeah, so I, I have a closet in my office and I have, you know, shirts hanging up. And and for the most part, you know, this is like giving you a little bit of inside. For the most part, the shirts that are hanging up, while nice, they're not shirts that I care about anymore. Like I won't wear them out. They're not going to, they. I, I may cut the grass in them. Still nice, but I'm not going to wear them out. So this was laying on um, an armoire in my uh, room and I'm like, well, well, why is this out? Because I think I might have had it on already, like twice. But what the hell? We're going to wear it again today because I still smell fresh. I'm just uh, telling you. No doubt. And if uh, Mrs. Ellis is like Mrs. So Wash, um, it's a good possibility she she took it and just wore it around for a little bit because she likes the smell of her man. OK. All right. That 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 could work. That could absolutely mm-hmm. work. Um, speaking of looking back over time. Not inside of my wardrobe, but actually, I look back over some of our show notes, and I do hope that you're feeling good this week. We got a lot to cover. Like, we got a lot of ground to cover over the next X number of minutes. Look back over the show notes. And I typed in, I said, how many times have we talked about the Holocaust on Crazy and the King? I came up with two, but I think there was a third one that I didn't do a good job of capturing. Wow. Okay. And last week was actually International Holocaust Remembrance Day. It it fell in last week. Uh, I want to say it was the 27th. I could be wrong about that. But this week, we got a little bit of issue that should shock all of us. And it was a tweet by Alexis Lerner, which actually is a thread that recapped some survey sentiments from 3,600 North American teens. Now, I think they're kind of unfair about the North American piece because when you get down in the story, they're not here in the 50 uh, U.S. states, which we got our own issue. We got Whoopi and we got some other folks that done kind of messed up about the... Did you see that? I did not. Oh, I'll tell you about it. Okay. But these North American teens teens are in Canada. And and I know you saw the threat. Yeah, so... Brass tax, right? Right now, anti-Semitism and crimes against uh, Jewish people are on the rise, not just in the United States, in but in Canada, in Europe. And really what's being pushed by a lot of our school board officials and representatives across the country right now is a whitewashing of history. And you and I have talked about that a lot. And in this uh, survey, they found that a third of students feel the Holocaust is exaggerated or fabricated? Exaggerated or fabricated? Like this really is interesting because the study was once again done in Canada. And in Canada, none of the provinces or territories have a responsibility to build Holocaust curriculum uh, into uh, a student's diet, if you would. Like, they don't have to learn about it up in Canada. We yeah. do a little bit down here. Go ahead. Little. Yeah, well, and and even I think that's not the most shocking, but six, most of the respondents didn't know that six million Jewish people died in the Holocaust. And they had no idea how many concentration camps there were. I mean, it just a general ignorance of 
probably the largest event in our modern history. And a third don't even believe it really happened. And the rest of them have no idea um, what that really means. Mm -hmm. And then you have Tennessee. Yes. So I don't know. If, have you ever heard of the book Moss? M-A-U-S, like mouse? It, it actually, I believe, I thought it was pronounced mouse, had not heard of it before International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day of last week. Like literally before the day, I had not heard about it. But then, of course, I started to hear some of the news drippings and I'm like, what is going on? But tell us about the book Mouse, because I want to see if you hit on the point that really stood out for me. OK, so it's a I'll call it a graphic novel um, right. about some mice who were Jewish and they um, tell their experience of being in the Holocaust through uh, a, an animal, a character. And it provides some Holocaust education for kids who are too young to see the, the graphic, graphic images of people starved to death and murdered. and. So Tennessee parents are now objecting to this book over nudity mm -hmm. and language. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, that is a naked mouse they mm -hmm. are objecting to. Is that mm -hmm. what stood out to you? That's, a, that, that's exactly what stood out for me. Like Because when I heard it last week, for I would say a day, day and a half, it was just around the book and the nudity and the language. Later, on that, that second day, someone explained that they were characters, mice, mouse, cat. And I said, wait a minute. So you're telling me that the mouse is naked? And yes. this is what folks are tripping on? Like the day before the Holocaust Remembrance Day? Yeah. It, it's, it's their diversion. Right. Yeah. It's like, hey, why don't you just say that you're anti-Semites? Why don't you just say that you don't want your kids to learn about the murder of six million Jewish people um, instead of trying to say the absurdity of a naked mouse? OK. All right. So let me bring let me bring Whoopi Goldberg in right here. OK. I I'm going to paraphrase what she said, because you said. Why don't you just say that you are an anti-Semite? Whoopi's. Um, her brouhaha, and you can see the, there's a link at the bottom of the, the show note if you missed it. Whoopi basically said, I, I'm paraphrasing it. She said that the Holocaust was not a racial incident because it was white individuals that were murdering other white individuals. Oh, Jesus. I, I can't remember what word she used, but she said it's not a racial incident. What do you say to that? I oh, now, um, now, mind you, she in no way did not minimize the incident. She just said it's not a racial incident, not like, well, you, you, you get the point. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I guess some people think about Judaism as the religion and not as a race or ethnicity um however right i think it is um also sometimes harder for people to understand what drives anti-semitism when their skin is lighter right when when you look white a lot of times as a jewish person um and i think it just does it and it, it just is is supremely ignorant sounding to say that it's not racial. The the final solution was built to eliminate a race of human beings, and that would be people of Jewish descent and people who practice Judaism, although you can convert to Judaism, correct. But I think it's very, very, very much a racial issue and should never be minimized in any way by saying, well, it was just white people attacking white people. So when we people. think about uh, and I don't I, I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, but I'm going to ask a question. So when we think about Ireland, how they fought, you know, parts of Ireland fought with the northerners. Is yep. that racial? 
no, that was religious. So that was Catholics versus versus Protestants. They were all Irish, right? But okay. that was Catholics versus Protestants, and that is a, a a hill I can't even a rabbit hole I can't even go down because very little historical understanding of okay. that conflict. If I'm being honest, uh, and and fine, and honesty is where I am. I couldn't comment because when I when I read some of the comments towards Whoopi in the context of this particular story. And how, you know, she was categorized as being an anti-Semitic individual. You know, I had to pause for a moment and I said, you know, again, I I try not to to throw out the phrase that a person is being racist or that a person is racist. I try to protect the use of that language because I know it's very strong. uh, And I, I just don't want to hang that on an individual when they don't absolutely deserve it. So I will say to you personally I, I actually reserved a comment and just simply said, you know, again, through all of the learnings that I've experienced and some of them more painful than the other, some of them more punitive than others. I, I just I looked at what Whoopi said in some of the comments and just said for a moment, this is one of those times where you just kind of sit back and you just watch and you try to learn through yep. the lens, through the eyes, through the experience of other people. But um, yeah. Alexis Lerner, thank you so much for sharing that study. I appreciate you. Um, you know, another, I, I, I'm smiling because you said blah, blah, blah. So y- you you weren't really all that excited about the CEO pledge uh, to get more companies to take diversity hiring more seriously? Yeah, I mean, let's say an article from, you know, um, featuring the CEO of Disability In, which is an organization that promotes the Disability Equity Index or Quality Index or something like that. Um, Jill Houghton, um, who's a member of our community, whose you know husband's a member of our community, and well, I have a great deal of respect for Jill, and and I have a great deal of respect for what Disability In is trying to accomplish. Uh, the conversation was literally the same old shit, right? It's good for, it's morally good. It's good for business. You don't talk about us enough, this, that, and the other. And it's like, dude, if we don't get up some new talking points and we don't move past this conversation of we have to be part of the conversation, you know, you have to accommodate us, but to start to have a question or a conversation about um, equity, right? It, it's no longer, if, if a company doesn't have disability in their strategy, in their, um, their focus in terms of hiring, growing, promoting, attracting talent in a consumer base, y- y'all are about 10 years past that ship has sailed. And now it's time to start talking to companies who want to actually make change, who want to hire, who see the value in our community, who want to be inclusive and create equity because the same old conversation is just not moving the fucking needle. It is not moving the needle at all. So if I'm hearing you correctly, nothing wrong with the pledge. You're not taking issue with the pledge. We're taking issue with the narrative inside of the Business Insider story. The, the content of the story. So what you're saying is, let's talk about the, the 100 or so companies that signed the pledge. Let's show some example of perhaps why they signed the pledge, maybe some of the case study internally that prompted them, that motivated them, that inspired them to sign the pledge, but not a story focused on, we got 100 companies that signed, but we're not being in I absolutely felt the same way when I read it. I was like, like literally I was speed reading as I floated up, you know, I'm just sliding mm-hmm. to join up the screen because I'm like seeing this movie. Like we talk about it every week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not like one for pledges. I, I, they're not a bad thing in terms of creating pressure on other CEOs or other executives to take the same commitment but if they're not followed by demon demonstrable demonstrable um outcomes if if you don't hire if you don't retain like a self-report index or a self-report pledge doesn't mean anything to the community if more people aren't getting to work and there's still only 16 percent of working age adults with disabilities that are employed and so clearly it's just not enough 
Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Speaking of disability, there was an incredible family uh, who found out that their son was diagnosed with diagnosed with autism. Uh, they actually lived down in Atlanta, uh, and the family, instead of, I don't want to say the word curling up, they were they sprang into action. And so when they received the diagnosis that the son was autistic, they actually created a grocery store. So how cool is that? Like it's, I want to say it's the first black owned grocery store that is like uh, automated. Like I absolutely love this. Contactless. Yeah. No, contactless. Contactless. Yes. Uh, Jamie and Jalea, Jalea, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Hemmings, um, opened an autonomous grocery store called Nourish and Bloom Mark. And it's the first contactless grocery store with robotic delivery in the United States and the first black owned autonomous grocery store in the world. So, in the world. In the world. This story is amazing on so many levels. And, you know, People with disabilities sometimes get very frustrated when um, the approach to a disability is like, you know, well, you should eat better, you should meditate, or you should, you know, do some yoga or something like that to like deal with significant mental illness. But what the the Hemings did is they took the approach of like, hey, we're going to treat our son. Um, to be as high functioning as possible. And that includes making sure that his diet supports the most, most healthy lifestyle he can have, which is good for all of us. And so through the approach of how they wanted to nourish, not just their child with autism, but all of their children, um, they recognize the need for this market. And then to have it like so high tech and to be the first black, you know, owned autonomous grocery store. It's like, this is just a cool ass story. And I absolutely just went to Twitter to make sure that I followed them. You can find them on Twitter Mm -hmm. at Nourish Bloom Market, abbreviated MKT. It's Nourish Bloom MKT. Love, love, love what they are doing. And this right here is an inspiration because when I think about um, you know, black and brown founders, when I think about others that are underrepresented, people from the disability community that are attempting to launch and start businesses, when I think about people from other ethnicities, of other geographies, other um, just backgrounds, when I think about the beauty that they can bring to our startup landscape, a landscape that impacts how we live, work, and play, I so appreciated this particular story and I'm absolutely rooting for the both of them. I think you said it right. Jamie and Jalea Hemmings, Jamie and Jalea Hemmings, shout out to the both of you. Last week, um, Mercedes Johnson got dragged on Twitter. Did you happen to see poor Miss Mercedes Johnson? I sure did. So how did you feel about that one? I, I, I don't know. So quick background, um, Mercedes put on her personal Facebook page that a young woman interviewed with her and was getting a salary that was about, I think it was about $50,000 lower because that's what the young woman asked for. And that she didn't personally have the bandwidth to give this young woman a lesson on salary negotiation. So, ouch. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Hold on, hold on. I got to do it. 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 I've stood in too many rooms with the microphone and I've said on far too many occasions, you all as women are raising your pom-poms and you are celebrating, excoriating, you know, celebrating when necessary, excoriating and others when we are talking about conversations around compensation. 
Yeah, that's right. Get them men. They're not paying us what we women absolutely ride that bandwagon like that train is never late. They will ride that bandwagon of piling on men, piling on organizations, piling on people for not paying them. And what I've said often, Jay, is. But HR is mostly women. Mm -hmm. So you're the one sliding the off letter across the table to another woman. Yep. And you know what the organization is or is not doing, yet you are complicit. Yeah. 50 G's. Yeah. Yeah. 85,000 to 130,000. And I, I am a hundred percent in agreement with you, especially in the work world. Women do not support other women. Now we'll, we'll get on the man bag bandwagon and I'll do that with you all day. But at the end of the day, women are, female leaders are harder on their female employees. They have higher expectations of their female employees and they are less likely to um, make excuses or give justification for failures to their female employees than their male employees. And, but, okay, let me, let me get the but. Mercedes put this on her personal Facebook page. Someone who knows her or saw this on her page, took it, posted it publicly, and it went viral. And she got dragged. And she, yes, she deserved to get a little dragon. But then she lost her job. What she also did was save the company thirty or $50,000. But because she did it in a very ungracious way and an incorrect way and talked about it, she lost her job. Did she deserve to lose her job over that? Or do we set a policy that we don't underpay regardless of salary cap and or salary request? And we do take time to make sure that young women understand salary negotiation. And this is the other piece, you know, the other training that we're going to put in for, um, you know, pay inequity or training on pay inequity. But instead, they said, oh, it's Mercedes fault. And they just canned her ass. Like, I think that's bullshit, too. I agree. You, you won't get any argument out of me. This was one of those experiences, one of those situations where we could have absolutely learned, uh, used it as a learning moment, a teachable moment, as they say and made everybody better. Like, imagine what the story would have been like had we taken this viral moment, we self-reflected as a leadership team, because trust and believe, this is not the first time that it's happened, and this is not the, and Mercedes is not the only one that knows that it's happening inside of said organization. We take this viral moment, we self-reflect. As a leadership team, we make a more pronounced and demonstrative stand that this is what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we make that employee right based on their experience and acumen and accomplishment and what they brought to the table. Maybe it's not 135, but this is what we're going to do. We're going to make Mercedes right, as you just illustrated. But we as a leadership team are going to be right. Missed another opportunity. Yep. And, and instead of being able to show the world that they care about their people and diversity and inclusion and growing, instead of showing that, they just did the cut and run. Yep. Easy. And, and the the real question is is are they paying that uh, that woman what she deserves or what she um, put in as her salary requirements? That to me question. is the the rest of the story. It absolutely is the rest of the story. But in a flash, Apple is refusing to buy Peloton. Mark Cuban launched an online drug company and Asusu, a fintech company that uses a non traditional metric of on time payment, rent payments to evaluate a user's credit worthiness 
and reported to the bureaus. They reached that billion dollar valuation last week. Cha-ching. We call it one Billy. Morgan State University is the first HBCU with a fintech center. And Kanto on Disney Plus strikes a major chord in a diverse world, according to The Guardian. And somewhere out there, a 25-year-old is looking in the mirror saying, there is absolutely nothing wrong with me dating Mackenzie Scott. That Mackenzie Scott. I mean, maybe not that exact Miss Mackenzie Scott, but you know what I mean. And no matter what the age, industry, location, perceived success, stay through this break. Julie and I will be right back. Really quick before Torin and I hop back into the episode, have you heard about the new job bite? The social recruiting innovator is now the end-to-end TA suite leader, helping TA teams attract, engage, hire, onboard, and promote the talent they need to succeed. But built specifically for talent acquisition professionals, the Job by Talent Acquisition Suite delivers an unmatched depth of capabilities from AI to DNI, recruitment marketing to applicant management, new hire onboarding, employee referrals, internal mobility, all with next gen analytics to help you prove the value you deliver to your organization. Whatever your recruiting challenge, Jobvite has a solution. Visit jobvite.com slash C-A-T-K today. Again, jobvite.com forward slash C-A-T-K. Now let's get back into the show. All right. So I think we're going to have to uh, do a little more research into that on time payment um, for rent company. That's a susu. A susu. That and- has a lot to do with diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, but of course, this week could not go by without the announcement of the retirement of Justice Stephen Breyer from the Supreme Court and the silly, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, melee that has now overtaken our media and my Twitter following or my Twitter feed. Um, Because as I'm sure that you know, um, when then nominee Biden was in South Carolina, he made a commitment that if he were able to appoint someone to the Supreme Court, that he would choose a highly qualified very capable and experienced black jurist, black and female app- jurist, excuse me, black woman jurist. And apparently most of America wants a full list of qualified candidates as options for the Supreme Court, not just a highly qualified, accomplished black woman. They don't want a list of just them. They want a full list of qualified individuals. 73% of people in a poll It was in the headline, uh, the majority of Americans want Biden to consider all possible nominees for the Supreme Court vacancy. There was a poll taken, 73% don't like the fact that he is curating a short list of highly accomplished, qualified black women. They want the list to be full. And I wonder if while you are listening right now, if you know that former President Trump appointed 54 people to appellate courts, 54 in his four years, and not one was black. Not a black man, not even a black woman. Let our producer put this clip in and then we're going to have a conversation around this whole short list for the Supreme Court.
Details are emerging tonight about who is on the short list to replace Justice Stephen Breyer on the Supreme Court. ABC News has learned there are at least 14 black women under consideration. And the White House now confirming one candidate, Judge J. Michelle Childs, who is favored by South Carolina Representative Jim Clyburn. President Biden saying he will announce the nominee by the end of February. Here's ABC's White House correspondent, Mary Alice Parks. For the first time, the White House confirming the name of one woman being considered for nomination to the Supreme Court, J. Michelle Childs. A U.S. District Court judge in South Carolina, President Biden nominated Childs to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, but her confirmation hearing for that job, scheduled for Tuesday, postponed. The White House saying Judge Childs is among multiple individuals under consideration. Childs is the favorite pick of Biden's close confidant, Representative Jim Clyburn. Clyburn pushed Biden to make that campaign pledge to nominate the first black woman to the high court, a pledge Republicans have disparaged. Senator Roger Wicker facing criticism after saying any potential black female nominee must be benefiting from affirmative action. The irony is that the Supreme Court is at the very same time hearing cases about uh, about this sort of affirmative racial <laughs> discrimination yes. and, 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 and while adding someone who is the beneficiary of, uh, of this sort of quota. Wit, like you said, we know the president is considering more than a dozen black women for this nomination. And tonight, the White House is also responding directly to those comments from Senator Wicker, saying in a statement, President Biden has established one of the strongest track records ever when it comes to choosing extraordinarily qualified and groundbreaking nominees. Wit. Mary Alice Parks in Washington. So okay, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm absolutely peeved off. And for me, while we are discussing this, Jay, in the vein of politics, it's deeper. But go ahead. No, you tell me. You give it to me. Yeah, it's just deeper for me because when I think about that 73%, When I think about the poll and I just want a full list, I just want highly qualified individuals. I don't want you to reduce the list or to only include black women. I have to ask the question, how many of these 73% of individuals are making their way into our workplaces and they are the impediment as to why Individuals, employees, teammates, colleagues, HR managers, TA people, recruitment marketing folks, supplier diversity folks, CSR folks, ESG folks, philanthropic folks, board folks. It's why how many of those 73% are the impediment to people being intentional around inclusion and representation in the workplace? This is not just politics. These are people going into our corporate quarter. Yeah, well, and, and you know, if we if we think about it from uh, the totality, right? There have been 103 Supreme Court justices and 17 Chief Justices, which means there have been 120 um, jurists that have sat on the Supreme Court since George Washington appointed the original six back a long time ago. Not one of them has been a black woman. Only five of them have been women, period. And zero have been black women. So to me, right, the court has never benefited from the views or lived experiences of a black female. And that tells me that there is absolutely no one more qualified to be chosen than a black woman. And it's again, dumbfounding to me and to your point is that there's no reason to pick this fight right now, right? The court is still going to be a 6-3 court. Roe v. Wade is still going to be overturned. 
we are likely looking at, at, at a conservative court for the next 20 plus years. Breyer was a, a, a centrist, moved more to the left as he got older. All of the women that I've seen on the short list are dramatically more middle left than I would prefer them to be. Um, but all three are incredibly qualified. Most have clerked for the Supreme Court. They all have impeccable educations. They've been, a couple of them have been Senate confirmed multiple times. Like, there's no win in the conversation for people like Ted Cruz or Gabby, what's her name, uh, to have this conversation. It just shows the pushback and the need to create divisiveness and to keep black women down and subjugated for no other reason than to just do it. Yeah. No other reason. I mean, I think about, you know, uh, what, what did Ted Cruz, um, uh, I'm sorry, Senator uh, Collins, she said that uh, President Biden has handled this clumsily. Tulsi Gabbard and Ted Cruz both slammed the president. Ted Cruz actually called it offensive. He said it was offensive that we would curate a list or limit the list only to black women. Offensive to black women. He said this was offensive to black women. Now, mind you, this is the same um, wet as tissue paper Ted Cruz who wouldn't even stand up for his own wife to Donald Trump. Yeah, thank God I, he's I, defending black women. You, you know, we, we absolutely need you over here, Ted Cruz, to help defend black women when you wouldn't even defend your own wife. And, and here's the issue, you know, around tokenization, because that's what a lot of people are going to say. A lot of people have said in the past, continue to say right now, that when we have affirmative action, when we have diversity policies, goals, targets, that intentionality that I mentioned, when we do that, that we are, are, are hiring tokens, that we are placing tokens in position. Even some black and brown people feel like they are a token. Whole nother discussion. But to that point around tokenization, Alicia, uh, Alicia Adamson, prophet, uh, she's a lawyer down in Florida. She said that, quote, people are going to say she only got this because she was a black woman. And that could not be further from the truth. She would not even be considered if she wasn't qualified, prepared, and ready. That's said by Miss Prophet you know, a, a lawyer down, down in Florida. And, and that's the part that we try over and over and over repeatedly. I mean, repeatedly, 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 we try to get people to understand that when you are intentional about uh, identifying audiences, groups of people, communities that are overlooked and marginalized, absent from the conversation, when you are intentional about bringing them to the table, including them in the, uh, including them in the room, placing them in a position of power, submitting or, or soliciting their feedback, their contribution. When you are intentional about that, that's not a lowering of the bar. That's not us trying to tokenize them. It's, it's placing them there because they absolutely have earned it. And if they haven't earned it, that will show itself over time. But to to say that going after a voice, I, I, I just listened to what you said a moment ago, Julie, and I think about I think about all of the predatory activity that took place in the 60s to break up black families in public housing. I think about the drug laws and the effort that was placed into uh, the crime bill in the, what was that, the 90s? I think about Reagan in the 80s and his um, propping up black women as the poster of welfare when we know that that's the furthest thing from the truth. When I think about 
the number of decades that I've been at least a conscious or an awake teen up until and through adulthood, all of the instances in which we could have used the contribution and the voice of black women, healthcare today, healthcare. We are, we are sorely missing out on that rich discussion that I know a black woman could add to whatever conversation is taking place from the bench. Yeah. And, and let's, as we just wrap up this segment, if you're not following along two of the top names, we talk about women who are extremely qualified, black women who are extremely qualified. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson is a clerk a former clerk of Justice Breyer. Um, she worked at the U.S. Sentencing Commission. She has been a federal trial court judge in the D.C. Circuit since 2013, and she has been Senate confirmed two times, including by the current Senate. Uh, Leandra Kruger, who is a member of the California Supreme Court, is a graduate of Harvard and Yale, was previously another clerk on the court, and has argued a dozen cases before the Supreme Court at the federal level. Tell me if any white man had those qualifications, or any white woman, I'll just go ahead and say it, any white woman had those qualifications that we'd be having this discussion. Amy Coney Barrett never tried a case in federal court. Uh, Say that again. Amy Coney Barrett never tried a case in federal court. Never. Never. Tried a case in federal court. Her voice, great way to take us to our Her Voice segment. Take us to the first person in South Korea, Jay. Well, before we do that, we have to introduce our newest sponsor. Oh, maybe that was one of the surprises that you didn't let me in on last week. It is. So we are welcoming this week our new, newest crazy and this king sponsor, excuse me, Tal Vista. Um, we are thrilled. We love working with that team over there. I've worked with them on a couple other projects and we're so excited when they um, came around a couple weeks ago and said they want to support crazy and the king. So thank you, Tal Vista. Welcome to the crazy and the king family. And let's take our first ad listen for them. All of us have unconscious biases, but you're not alone when it comes to disrupting them. Talvista combines humanity with technology to help you make consciously inclusive decisions at every point in your hiring process. Their optimized job descriptions, redacted resume reviews, and structured interviews augment your decision making by layering a layer of conscious inclusion. Talvista's tools are 100% research-based and avoid the bias inherent in pure AI tools. Get the best of both worlds by combining humanity and technology. Check them out at talvista.com forward slash pod. Awesome, right. awesome, 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 awesome. Love the work that they are doing over there at Talvista. And certainly appreciate them for believing and trusting in our curated voices. Her voice segment, South Korea. Yes, South Korea internet giant Naver has named 40-year-old Choi Soo-yeon an attorney who now leads their overseas operations or who did leave their overseas operations as its new CEO as it aims to expand internationally and improve a corporate culture that some say is toxic. Congratulations, Suyan. My dear friend Darlene Slaughter made the Elite 100 list of women compiled by Diversity Women Media. The list celebrates Black women, Black women who have toppled barriers and risen to the upper echelons of their respective organizations. We will actually post the complete list in the show notes, but you can go over to uh, at Diversity Woman on Twitter if you'd like to engage with the organization and see the list for yourself. And uh, Maisha Cannon joins perhaps the most exciting games company on the on the planet, uh, Robolux, as a program manager. You can follow her on Twitter at Talent Genie. One of my favorite people in the entire world. When we were doing our new formation cohort last year, uh, trying to, I would say, um, 
give a foundation on DNI and DEIB to a number of people. Maisha was the first person uh, to jump out. She was the first person to jump out and said, Torrin, I will absolutely come and talk to your cohort. So we love the work that you are doing over at Maisha. Have fun. I got some folks over at Roblox uh, that I know. I want to make sure that they are treating you well. Our quote for the week. And whilst we have so much more to understand, I've made the presumption we are getting there that it is always better to add a plus to the universe and never a minus. That was said by Hung Lee, curator of recruiting brain food. If you are not following Hung, please find Hung Lee, H-U-N-G Lee on Twitter and go to recruitingbrainfood.com. All right. Name drop for this week uh, is to Jared Allman, um, Skillsoft. He is a listener of Crazy and the King, a uh, big fan of Torin, big fan of John Graham, also a big fan of Julie Sowash, um, connected with me on LinkedIn. And we just had the opportunity to have a great conversation. And so I, I definitely love that. Thank you, Jared, and look forward to hearing and connecting with more listeners this year. And of course, we are kicking out Black History Month. I mean, every day we try to make it history, but Microsoft's legacy project is out in the uh, ecosystem. And it's a project that's going to give students an interactive Black History Month experience. It offers a rich Black history curriculum to all schools. Got to go to website or go out on Google and just look for Microsoft's legacy project. The link is too long for me to mention right here, but go out on Google, look for Microsoft's legacy project. I close reminding each and every one of you to share the pod with your digital tribe and to find your voice. Be a better human. Let's create better culture, teams, and workplaces. For now, Jay and I are ghosts. Everything is changing fast in talent acquisition and keeping yourself up to date with the latest thinking, technology and best practice is a challenge in itself. I'm Matt Alder, host of the Recruiting Future podcast, the show that gives you weekly insights, inspiring stories and cutting edge thinking from practitioners who are at the front line of talent acquisition. Recruiting Future is available wherever you listen to your podcasts.